Okay, folks. Well, I'm going to go to Jodrell Bank to do the questions uh, for today's group study. Um, before we go to Jodrell, Jodrell Bank's a perfect place to look at the um, subject matter that we're going to be looking at. We've looked at the space race, Generation X, the fact that um, this whole generation was affected by the Cold War, came off the back of the Cold War. Um, Jodrell Bank was the first telescope in the world to pick up on the heat signature of the Sputnik satellite, which we've, we, we've looked at a couple of times. The Sputnik satellite was the first satellite to be launched into space by Russia, and Jodrell Bank, the telescope we're going to be looking at, was the first uh, telescope to pick up on the heat. So way before it picked up on the bleep, which even amateur people on ham radio could pick up on the bleep, Jodrell Bank actually picked up on the heat signature of the thing. So it was, um, it was a very important telescope back in its day. It used to be the largest one in the world, radio telescope in the world. Before we look at that, I thought it would be a good thing to begin by um, going back to the baby boomers just for a minute and, and using their history, using the history not of Generation X, the baby boomers, those that were born immediately after World War II, using their history, how would you present to the baby boomers a gospel that they could relate to? Does that make sense? So using the baby boomers history, what they've been through, and bearing in mind that in the 1960s they were at their most impressionable, using their own history, how would you present them with a gospel that they could most identify with? So, you know, we can recontextualize the gospel but we can't redefine it. In other words, the gospel must remain the same, but the way that you present that gospel to people changes in terms of their culture and time and so on and so forth, but the gospel itself never changes. So there's a, there's a good beginning discussion point. We really need to get, the church really needs to get back to thinking about how to witness to people that haven't got eternal life, that don't know Jesus Christ as Saviour. And it's kind of like trying to get a kid to eat Brussels sprouts. They don't want to, but we need to. We really need to get back to thinking about how to witness to people. So that's the first thing to do before we go any further. So as a teenager, I used to love going out on my bike and we used to bike it quite, quite long distances really. You know, even from the age of 13, we'd bike it to Buxton over all the hills, really steep hills, 17 miles, 34 miles there and back. And we, we even biked it to Wales once and uh, that was quite a long way. And we just stayed, we camped for one night and then came back. But this is, a, this is a bike ride I used to enjoy going on. These are the Cheshire Plains, so it's very flat. I, used, I, I tried to get into um, astronomy um, about 15 years ago. And um, I got a, um, a uh, telescope, trying to think what kind, Dobso, Dob, Dobsonian, is that what you call them now? Do you know, I can't remember a Dobsonian mount telescope with a Newtonian tele, uh, telescope mirrors. And it was, it's, it's a really interesting hobby, astronomy is. The only problem is, in our country, it's pretty much always cloudy. You know, you don't get many clear nights. Um, and also there's too much light pollution. So as interesting as it was, and it really was interesting, I can remember the first time I saw Jupiter, and it's just a mind blower. When you see 
not necessarily Jupiter, but you see the moons, the four predominant moons you see through a telescope and how far away they are from Jupiter. It's absolutely mind blowing the first time you see Jupiter. When you, the first time you see Saturn is, it doesn't look real. It looks like something out of a comic. It's, it's tiny. In a telescope, Saturn looks tiny, but you can make out, in a really good telescope, you can make out two rings. Um, in, in, in the sort of telescopes I was using, you can just see a ring around it, and it just, it doesn't look real. It looks like somebody's stuck a tiny little Saturn on the front of the lens. 100 yards, 100 yards to Jodrell Bank. Okay, just a little bit of background. The guy that built Georgia Bank was a man called Sir Bernard Lovell. Sir Bernard Lovell was a committee Christian, played the organ in a ch uh, chapel local to this area, and he was one of those that could hold the tension between science and uh, the Bible. And um, he, uh, during the war, uh, Second World War, he refused to fight in terms of, you know, pulling the trigger. So anyway, they they they. They pulled him into uh, uh, helping to be one of the designers on the early radar system all along the east coast. And he was incredibly successful in that, saved untold amounts of lives through the early warning radar system. So him and his team were then brought into Parliament to um, have an, uh, 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 an audience with Winston Churchill. And Churchill, they went into the, this room, Churchill was there by, by this crackling fire with a big pipe at, um, cigar in his mouth and Churchill said, gentlemen, I want you to take the technology that you've used for the early warning radar system and I want you to shrink it down small enough so it'll fit in the nozzle of a Lancaster bomber, which back then was just, in, what he was asking him to do was ridiculous. And it, they said, it, it just can't be done. So he said to the, to the team, go in that room, pointed to a room. He says, don't come out until you can tell me that you can do this before Christmas. Anyway, they went into this room, they came out, they said, it's, we can't do it before Christmas. But what we can tell you is that, is that we will do our very, very best to uh, do it. Anyway, it was about four or five months late, but they did successfully manage to shrink down that technology to fit into the nozzle of a Lancaster bomber and it detected many, many U-boats out on the English Channel and saved the lives of many of our ships. Yay! So the last time I came here, uh, I'd, got, I'd got tripods with me and cameras and all that and they said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm just doing a little uh, uh, video for the, for the church and um, they said you can't do that. So this time, the only thing I've got, the only, well, I have got another camera in there, but the only camera I'm probably gonna use is this tiny little GoPro because I don't want that again. I want to be able to get in here to see what I need to see and, uh, and come out. Okay, this is all brand new. I've never seen any of this before. The story of George Will Bank. Oh, okay. So you can show in progress. It's worth pointing out, by the way, that Sir Bernard Lovell, who uh, I've already explained, he was massively used in World War II and uh, his findings basically saved thousands upon thousands of lives. At the end of World War II, he had a complete, he was burnt out. As so many people were, he had a complete breakdown. And uh, it was quite some time before he kind of, uh, what's the right word? Got that kind of restoration, uh, a reset in his life where he was ready for the next project. And of course his next project was this. It was nothing like this originally, they just, Manchester University managed to buy a plot of land here on the Cheshire Plains and um, it's just a little bit of scaffold in the field but he had this dream of building the world's biggest telescope. The only way of, of really getting the size of this is to see the birds. When you see the birds I'll try 
and film some of the because you won't see them on this camera but once you see the birds sort of flying around it you realize this thing is massive and that's what you call a tent oh, i love tents like that i just love tents i don't know why i've always loved tents <laughs> look at that that's made of some decent cotton wow oh, man that's amazing yeah you can stick a chimney in the middle of there you'd live in this couldn't you there you go that tells you when it was built 57 what happened in 57 sputnik so basically as soon as this thing was built shows you the look shows you how big the dish is as soon as this thing was built it was brought straight into operation by detecting the heat signature of uh, the Russian satellite. There he is, there's the man, and that's what it looked like at the beginning. Never despise the day of small things, friends. Goodness, there's no kids around this part. You know, I, I, it's a great place for kids to come on, not being cynical, it is. So 1957, that's when this thing was complete. Look at that for a project. 90 miles of scaffold. Yeah. I know that they went over the budget, the original budget, by something like five times the amount that they, they expected it to go over. Here we go. This is what I wanted to see. <laughs> Sputnik in the space race. 4th of October 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, first artificial satellite. It was the dawn of the space age. The first act of the newly built Lovell telescope was to use radar to detect Sputnik's carrier rocket, an intercontinental ballistic missile. You understand how important that is. It's an ICBM, so this necessarily isn't about the space race. This is about the arms race. It was the only instrument in the world capable of doing so. Besieged by reporters and film crews, Georgia Bank became world famous the telescope went on to play a key part in the tr in tracking the american pioneer space spacecraft and the soviet missions to the moon so basically the minute this thing was put uh, was was operational it was put into operation and it became known throughout the world isn't that amazing see now why we're here What I wanted to do, so you can hear when this thing's moving, right? So when it's moving, you hear this kind of sound. The search for life in space. A still from the 2005 movie of Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> That's the Vogan ship that picks up uh, Arthur Dent, isn't it? If you know anything about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Brill. Look at that, folks. Look at that. It's huge. You see the clouds moving? Look at the clouds moving above it. Phenomenal, isn't it? What a feat of engineering. The guy that built this played an organ in a local church, a committed Christian that could kind of hold science in tension with the Bible. It's easy to do that, by the way. You see, Genesis 1 is not a scientific account of how God created the heavens and the earth. It's more or less about why he created it. He doesn't have to explain how he did it to us. Just Genesis is about why. And sooner or later we find out why. We find out that it's all about fellowship with the highest point of his creation, which is us. And this whole world has been created uh, not only for the Lord's pleasure, but for us to enjoy his creation. And then people get greedy. Some of you guys will remember the CND, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Probably remember the kind of lefty hippies lying down in front of um, the lorries and the missiles and so on in Green and Common and you got uh, Michael Foote 
I think it was Michael Fort at the time. And uh, this kind of idea that we need to disarm. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's very difficult, isn't it? Do you disarm? Is that the right thing to do? And we're, in the war, we're faced with these horrible dilemmas. It, so if you look at Werner von Braun, we looked at this on Sunday morning, who was an SS officer that designed the V2 rocket that was way ahead of the Allies. The Germans were way ahead in terms of ballistics. What do you do? What do you do? Do you hang him? Do you put him to trial and hang him? Or do you take him, capture the scientists, find out what they've learnt and, um, and use them for your advancement? These are, these are dilemmas that you can't get away from in any war situation. Very often, um, things get very, very complicated. And um, we have these dilemmas. And, the, you know, I can remember the whole CND thing. And to be honest, I'll be honest with you, I never thought that we should disarm. I believe that we should, we should keep nuclear weapons um, because The only thing that's really stopped an all-out world war, probably for the last 80 years, is the fact that there's no way to win it. So imagine being Harry Truman. You've just come into presidency. Within two months of becoming the president, it's down to you whether you press a button that eliminates, in the most horrific way imaginable, over 200,000 lives, many of which are completely innocent, as far as the world goes, completely innocent. So the first thing I want you to look at is this. Look at scriptures that are for and against war. Look at the scriptures that are for and against war. And how, as Christians, how is... What, what do we deem as a just war? Is there such a thing as a just war? Is there a, a circumstance of which Christians can say, this is a just war, I can join in and help the cause? Have a look at scriptures for and against war and discuss within yourselves, is there any point where in, in history where you can look and say, this is a just war? So Truman clearly had to make that decision, and he did, and he pressed the button. And over 200,000 people over the course of, as the years rolled by, died directly and indirectly of those two nuclear blasts. But it brought the war to an end. So have a look at scripture for and against, and discuss yourselves. Would you enter a war? If you were called up, would you take up arms against an enemy? Would you? Would you? for instance, have joined in the Vietnam War. Have a think about these things. What do you think? The more time goes on, the more I'm, I'm becoming uh, burdened with how we communicate the gospel to the people that we're in contact with and the generation and the age that we're in. How on earth do you describe biblical peace to somebody that knows nothing about the Bible. And I just want you to think about this question for a minute. Peace is, a, is, is one of those things that it's, it's so fleeting, it, it's so fickle, it's so false in this world, it just doesn't last. Has there ever been a time when there's been peace? You could, almost, you could almost argue that the First World War, the Second World War and the Third World War to come are just going to be one continuing war. When Jesus says in Matthew 24 that unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive, to me, that was written 2,000 years ago, to me, that in itself is massive evidence that the Bible foresaw what was coming that something was coming that could wipe out all of humanity. Incredible that the Bible even says that, but it does, because it's right. The Bible's always been prophetic. It's always um, predicted future events. Of course it has, and it's clearly predicting the one that's to come. So the next point is this. 
when talking to somebody about peace, you know, you might be talking to them about what's happening right now with Ukraine and Russia. How do you go, how do you cause a person to engage and actually talk about the things that we see around us and the patterns, and then at some point get around to what the Bible says peace is? And what does the Bible say peace is? What does peace actually look like? So have a think about that. How do you engage with somebody and talk about peace, real peace, when we're talking about Russia, Ukraine? You can't just go in there and say, the Bible says this, and they say, oh, does it really? Oh, please, I must get saved. How do we go about these things, friends? We've got to be wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. When I was first saved, I was still going out with a girl that wasn't a Christian. At the time, I, th I thought that I loved her. Um, and she, she was an art student in Dundee. And um, as an art student, she went through the whole transformation of having nice long hair to having a skinhead. These are the days of Sinead O'Connor and all that. So I can remember coming back from university one time with the skinhead thinking, OK, that's my girlfriend. She's got a skinhead. Um, but for quite some time, as a, as a brand new Christian, probably about six months, I was still kind of going out with her. The, the whole sex thing was cut out. Um, but I'd still go up and visit her at university. And um, her and her friends, you know, would go on these big pub crawls like the students did. And so I went out with them and I said, look, I'm going to see if I can find a church that's open. I did. I found this church and I think it was called The Gate. And um, like I said, I'd only been saved probably less than six months. And I walked into this church and there was no chairs. It was just full of students. They were sitting on the floor. There was two guys playing acoustic guitars. It was very chilled. And instantly, when I walked into that room, I sat down, I knew that these were my people. I'd come home. Um, and I knew that this girl that I was seeing was not going to be my long-term girlfriend. But I felt such a peace, such an incredible peace in that place, which was in the middle of Dundee, in the student scene, uh, these, these students had obviously given their lives to Christ and rather than doing what everybody else was doing, they were worshipping the Lord on a Friday night together. And I think apart from my initial salvation, that was one of the first times I experienced a tremendous sense of peace. The next time I experienced a tremendous sense of peace was when a, a, a pastor from down south came up to our area uh, and he, he preached at a church local to us in Bucknell. And he was a phenomenal preacher. He was trained by David Wilkerson. And he was a very confrontational preacher. He had an incredible anointing, an incredible passion. And I was hanging on the edge of my seat listening to him. And although all the words that he was speaking were searching me out, it was like piercing straight through me, I came away from that night with this sense of incredible peace, incredible peace. So here's the next question. What are the points in your Christian life when you felt an almost tangible sense of peace? This is going to sound a bit weird, but... Just before COVID broke out, I'd, I'd had my operation. They'd taken out this tumour and I was awaiting results. And I, I, I will always now forever be, have empathy for people. Oh, it's just starting up, folks. Can you hear it? It's just starting up. Fantastic. It's just starting up. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's brilliant. This whole thing. Oh, I think it stopped. <laughs> it's, it's not moved far, but it's probably moved trillions of miles from, from the last target that it was pointed at. 
So, yeah, I came out of hospital just as COVID broke out and I was awaiting um, results for whether this tumour was cancerous or not. And while I was awaiting the results, COVID broke out and um, I was in a lot of discomfort. Um, and um, it was a most bizarre thing. So when you go when you're going through things, particularly things that could could be life threatening, you, you you kind of think, do other people know what that feels like? And that's why I say I've always had empathy now towards people that are going through things like that. But when COVID broke out, and all of a sudden, everybody suddenly felt like their lives were being threatened. I remember lying down in the camper van that I was self-isolating in. Mandy was in the bungalow with the kids. They'd come back from uni. Everybody had been put into lockdown. I can remember lying down in the camper van with this incredible peace. An incredible peace. Even in pain, you know, even with physical pain. An incredible peace. Not knowing what the results of the tumour were going to be or anything, but this incredible peace, like almost <laughs> off the scale peace. And all of a sudden, everybody's frightened about getting COVID and dying. And I'm thinking, I've, I've had this feeling for the last six months, maybe longer, as to you don't know how long your life's going to be. Now, this question is far more personal, really. And uh, you're going to have to think about this one. When the Soviet Union put the Berlin Wall up, JFK came out with a statement, which is a profound statement, really. He says, democracy has many problems, but we've never had to put a wall up to stop people from leaving our country. And I think that's uh, one heck of a statement. And here's the question. Have you ever tried to hold on to something that wasn't yours to hold on to? Have you ever tried to hold on to something that God did not want you to hold on to? It may be before you were saved, it may be after. Have you ever tried to hold on to something that wasn't yours to hold on to? And what did it feel like? How did it make you feel when perhaps that person wanted to go? Okay, just one last question. The whole generation, the Generation X, kind of lived in this era of a false peace. There was always this kind of looming uh, sense that the red horse might start riding at any point. With the Christian, there's kind of like real peace, true peace. There are times when you can lose your peace completely. And both of those two are, we've talked about what it is to have real peace. Have you ever lost your peace? Have you ever lost your peace? What did that feel like when you lost your peace? And secondly, have you ever pretended to be at peace? when you're not at peace at all? Have you ever pretended to be at peace when you're not at peace at all? <laughs> and when you lost your peace, how did you get that peace back? Folks, well, I hope you've enjoyed this little tour of Jodrell Bank. Again, the guy that designed this, committed Christian, saved thousands upon thousands and thousands of lives in World War II. By the way, the irony is that ultimately his technology 
that was shrunk down into the nozzle of a Lancaster bomber was used to, uh, to detect the V-2 rockets that Werner von Braun constructed to bomb our country. This man here, this committed Christian, was responsible for knocking many of those out. And like I've already said, Werner von Braun would go on to become a hero of America as one of the uh, spearhead leaders of NASA. How ironic, how messed up is that? How utterly messed up. Life's complicated, isn't it? You know, all is, what do they say, all is not fair in love and war. Life is complex. Things are never that clear cut. I, that's why I love looking at the life of David when he's on the run from Saul. It's just messed up. But God works through messes, friends. He, 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 he specializes in working through messes. He worked through the mess of the First World War. He worked through the mess of the Second World War. He worked through, worked through the turmoil of the Cold War and the proxy wars. And he will work, work through any wars that you and I find ourselves in. He's the expert of working through messes. So if your life feels messed up at this moment in time, take courage. God is an expert at working through messes.